All right, hi everyone, I'm Jerry, and as Sagar said, I'll be presenting the next 30 or so minutes uh, where we're gonna not do anything interactive, and I'm just gonna talk about uh, all the various SOC components in Chipyard, uh, Chipyard's various flows, and generally the architecture of how everything fits together inside this Chipyard FireSim ecosystem. Um, so kind of the motivating uh, development, what, what motivated the development of Chipyard was, you know, we're architects, we like to build custom SOCs with custom components, uh, you know, what does that entail? What kind of flows do we go through when we, when we, when we do our work, right? And so generally what we think of is we come up with some custom SOC architecture um, with some new blocks, you know, some new accelerators, new devices, maybe new CPUs. Uh, but you, you know, that you aren't reinventing the whole system every time. So you want to reuse as many existing blocks as possible uh, to evaluate your novel idea. And in evaluating your novel idea, depending on, you know, the level of evaluation you want to do, um, there's a number of different flows you might go down, right? If you're doing, you know, very early stage design work, you can just get by with RTL simulation. Uh, if you want to run longer workloads, like, you know, using Linux or something, then you need a faster simulation running on the FPGA using FireSim. Uh, if you want to do a cool demo really quickly, maybe you don't need FireSim, you just do an FPGA prototype. Uh, but finally, if you want, you know, actual silicon back and you want to actually tape out the chip, well, then you got to go through the whole VLSI physical design flow process. And that is a whole, you know, monster of a job in itself. And so uh, kind of all these different flows, you know, we all want to take the same design and push them through each of these different flows uh, in, sim in a similar way in, this, in a unified environment, essentially. And that's kind of what motivated the organization and development of Chipyard um, with the high level diagram, which you see on the right. Um, so what is Chipyard? Uh, depending on who you ask, you might get different answers, but you know, uh, a broad overview here is we see it as an organized framework for various SOC design flows uh, and design tools where, you know, regardless of what you're trying to do, uh, Chipyard hopefully can provide a sane and you know, nice user interface uh, where you can take some custom SOC architecture from a single starting point and push it through you know, whatever target downstream flow you want. Uh, to address the issue of you know, reusing available open source IP, uh, Chipyard is also a curated IP library of open source RISC-V SOC components, including things like cores, memory system components, a couple of accelerators, and various things which you might not really think about, but you know, are really necessary as part of bringing up an SOC like JTAG or UR uh, SPY, for example. And finally, the combination of um, unifying these flows uh, with this library of open source generators uh, has suggested that this is kind of more like a, metho a methodology for Agile SOC architecture design, where you have a single starting point, a single ground truth, essentially, for where your SOC is, and a unified flow for taking that ground truth SOC and pushing it through uh, whatever evaluation flow you want. So uh, I'm going to walk through uh, the various parts of this diagram and kind of go into more detail over the various components here. I'm going to start with the library of SOC uh, component generators in Shipyard because these generators and how they interact with each other is really what defines the uh, set of SOCs which, capable, which Shipyard is capable of describing. Uh, so this is an example of a, a high-level block diagram of an SOC that one might generate in Shipyard. Um, and this diagram uh, encapsulates many of the components that uh, you know, most SOCs will have and are provided uh, as open source blocks integrated into Shipyard. Uh, so starting out with like, you know, what's some considered to be the heart of an SOC or the CPUs. Um, in Chipyard and Rocketchip, the CPUs are abstracted within these blocks called tiles, where each tile contains a RISC-V core and its private L1 caches and some other components like, you know, it's TLB, page table walker, maybe a tightly coupled accelerator. Um, there's several different varieties of core supported, uh, which I'll talk about later. But I think what's important here is this tile interface is like a pretty clean interface um, and it makes it easy to integrate an existing, you know, non-chisel, non-rocket chip uh, CPU imp implementation and integrate it into the Chipyard SOC system. And I'll show how that's done in a moment as well. So kind of the standard cores that uh, most people will use in Chipyard, at least starting out with, are uh, Rocket and Boom. So Rocket is the first uh, open source RISC V CPU, you know, developed alongside RISC V many years ago. It's a, in order a single issue 64-bit RISC V core. Uh, at this point, it's like an efficient design point for low power devices. On the other end of the, of the design space, we have Sonic Boom, uh, which has also been developed by Berkeley. Um, it's a superscalar out of order risk five core uh, containing many of the same advanced microarchitectural features you'll find in commercial high performance CPUs, um, like highly accurate TH branch prediction, out of order load story unit, out of order issue, register renaming, et cetera, et cetera. 
And this is really designed to be a high performance design point for general purpose applications. Um, both of these cores support the standard RV64 GC uh, RISC V ISA profile, which means they can boot off the shelf RISC V Linux distributions and run off the shelf packaged RISC V software. Uh, it just makes it really easy to bring up the software world of some custom workload as well, right? Because you can link against existing libraries and just run your you know, application in a normal you know, standard RISC V Linux distribution. And both of these uh, cores are full, fully synthesizable, tape out proven, and of course, they're both um, fully open source as well. Um, to kind of highlight that it is relatively easy to integrate other cores in Shipyard, uh, we integrated some of the pulp cores in Shipyard as well. Um, these cores are developed by uh, group ETH Zurich. Uh, CVA6 core and the IBEX core are you know, very popular system Verilog based cores for exploring this five SOCs. Um, and even though they speak uh, Axie 4 instead of Tilelink, um, I'll show how you know that doesn't really make it that much difficult, that much more difficult to integrate uh, this kind of IP into Chipyard as well. Um, so both of these cores are also available just as other tiles that you can drop into your system and simulate uh, in a Chipyard SOC. Um, for education, we we also have this set of uh, cores called Sodor, uh, which is a collection of 32-bit RIS5 cores designed not so much for actual like architecture research, but more for just teaching undergrads, um, you know, the basics of pipelining and CPU design, right? So there's examples here of single stage, two stage, three stage, five stage implementations. Um, and in the introductory computer architecture course at Berkeley, uh, students essentially, you know, go through the design of these cores and study how the microarchitecture affects the performance of some basic risk five programs. Um, so we also have a new feature in Shipyard 1.9, which just released this week, uh, which is the ability to drop in a functional model of a core within the Chipyard SOC environment. Uh, so Spike, if you uh, know about it, is a open source RISC-5 ISA simulator. It's a fast, extensible C++ functional model of a RISC-5 core. Uh, and this new feature in Chipyard, Spike as a tile, allows us to just instantiate this core or this Spike modeled core within a Chipyard SOC and have it talk to the rest of the SOC as if it was real RTL. Of course, performance measurements here aren't really uh, valid, but this is useful for, um, you know, debugging complex software in RTL simulation because the spike core can run, you know, much more quickly than an RTL simulation of an actual core. Uh, this is kind of similar to like an ARM virtual platform, if you know what that is. Uh, did you have a question? How is spike simulators like Gen 5? How is it like Gen 5? Uh, they're both ISA simulators and they're both uh, functional models in some sense. I believe Gen 5 does a little bit more on the performance modeling side of the complete SOC, where spike is focused on just modeling the functionality of like a minimal risk 5 core and system, right? Um, so beyond just, you know, general purpose standard RISC V ISA, uh, we also have this interface that a couple of the cores in Shipyard support called ROCK, ROCC. Uh, ROCC accelerators are these tightly coupled accelerators that, uh, you know, have a standard interface and we can drop in and attach them to existing rocket or boom cores without modifying the microarchitecture of those cores themselves. Um, and so the way this works is that if you attach a ROCK accelerator to a boom or rocket core, uh, the boom or rocket core will automatically, you know, when it decodes uh, an instruction for this accelerator, uh, it will automatically issue that instruction to this custom accelerator implementation instead of sending it down the rest of the core's pipeline. And the, and the accelerator can, you know, access or write to core registers uh, and also access other uh, core resources like the page table walker, the private L1 data cache, uh, or even go out to main memories through a separate port into the uh, rest of the SOC. So this has been a pretty flexible interface um, that supports a variety of accelerator designs. Um, in Shipyard, we have the Gemini machine learning accelerator, which we'll play with a little bit later today that is built using the ROCK interface. Uh, we also have some order vector accelerators and you know, example of SHA-3 accelerators uh, that implement the ROCK interface as well. Uh, finally, you can also, of course, uh, in implement or integrate your accelerator as a MMIO controlled device. Um, and so, you know, these are kind of the standard ways you have it driven by control registers that your core writes to. Um, some examples of accelerators that are in Chipyard that are integrated this way include the uh, open source NVIDIA MVDLA accelerator uh, and like a small DSP accelerator generator, just as an example. Uh, for the memory system in Shipyard, uh, we use a coherent interconnect. Um, the high-level protocol is Tilelink, which is an open source chip scale coherent interconnect standard. It's comparable to uh, you know, AXI or ACE, um, supports multi-core, accelerators, peripherals, DMA, coherent axes, et cetera. So it's you know, pretty general purpose uh, protocol for backbone for an SOC. 
In terms of the actual IP that implements Tilelink, um, there's a library of Tilelink RTL generators in Rocketship that uh, implement things like, um, like crossbar-based buses with adapters, clock crossings, buffers, and also you know, uh, notably adapters to AXI interfaces, so adapters to AXI4 and APB. Um, so these AMBA to Tilelink shims enable easy integration with the existing IP. Um, you take your existing system very log core or whatever that uses AXI4 uh, or APB or some other AMBA protocol, and then you just uh, put this AXI4 to Tilelink adapter on the end of it, and then it can just plug and play into the rest of the shipyard system. And this is how uh, we integrated things like the CVA6 core and the MVDLA accelerator. Uh, Finally, we also support uh, relatively recently, I think since Shipyard 1.8, um, replacing the crossbar-based interconnect in Shipyard SOCs with a network on chip-based interconnect. Um, the network on chip is generated by Constellation, uh, which is a parameterized chisel generator for SOC interconnects. Um, it can generate uh, pretty diverse topologies for a network on chip. Uh, it supports standard protocols. It supports Tilelink, of course, as well as Axie 4. Uh, this thing is highly parameterized. It generates, you know, deadlock-free, uh, virtual channel, channel wormhole-routed network on chips. And, you know, this is how we are, have been scaling up our designs towards uh, larger and larger SOCs. And you'll see uh, how to use this as well in the later portion of today's tutorial. Uh, for the outer memory system, you know, shared memory, there is an open source, coherent, uh, banked, distributed Tilelink L2 cache developed by Sci5. Um, it supports broadcast. Uh, we can also uh, build, instead of the L2 cache, a broadcast based coherence hub, or even build a totally incoherent memory system as well. So there's a variety of options here. Uh, for outer memory, um, there's you can build like a tiling port to external memory or an AXI4 port. Uh, if you build an AXI4 port, you can interface it with DRAM SIM to get uh, somewhat accurate uh, DRAM models uh, in software RTL simulation. Uh, but of course, in FireSim, uh, it will use FireSim's highly accurate uh, DRAM model. Um, peripherals devices, uh, of course, you know we have things like JTAG, um, debug, UART, GPIOs, SPY, all the kind of things, you know, bits and widgets that you need to build a real chip and make it useful and talk to the world. Um, we also have this library of things called test chip IP. These are kind of more like esoteric IP that we build for our test chips. Things like clock management structures generic serializers, deserializers, debug scratch pads, various things that you know maybe aren't so useful for the performance of your system. But if you build a chip and you need this feature to debug it, then you know, you're really thankful that it's there. Right, so this was a really fast tour through a lot of the components in the shipyard SOC architecture. But I think the high level takeaway is all these components are open source. There's a fairly well-organized library of uh, all these chisel generators, and they all integrate with each other and talk to each other in a sane way. Um, so it makes it pretty easy to scale out and build you know, highly complex or highly custom SOC systems. OK, so you know we have this large collection of generators, uh, but that doesn't really tell us how do we put them together to build a real SOC, right? You know, The challenge of integration in VLSI is obviously very, very difficult. Um, and so this is where uh, this feature in Rocketship and Shipyard called um, the config system comes into play. Um, so the idea in Shipyard and Rocketship essentially is that um, the definition of an SOC is driven by this one class called a config class. And this config class essentially describes a dictionary of uh, various keys that drive the various RTL generators uh, uh, that Shipyard integrates and drives them to you know, emit various components of the SOC. And so, for example, uh, in this config on the right, we have this custom config that um, is essentially a collection of these different config fragments. And each of these fragments uh, implements a different or, you know, drives a different part of the generators uh, in the total SOC uh, generator system. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, some of the uh, fragments on the top right will do things like change the parameters of the private caches within the tiles. Uh, they can change the width of the memory system, change the parameters of the L2. Uh, essentially, we can you know, compose an SOC by mixing in more and more of these fragments uh, as they describe you know, various parts of the entire system. Uh, and we'll do this uh, hands-on in the later part of the tutorial as well. OK, so at this point, we know how to describe an SOC in the shipyard world. We know, you know what's actually generating all the components of our SOC. Uh, what are the actual flows we want to go through? Just to summarize again briefly. Um, you know, at early stages, you can do RTL level simulation or with Verilator or VCS or uh, new in Shipyard 1.9. Uh, 
Um, we support Cadence Exilium for simulation as well. Um, for FPGA prototyping, you can build fast non-deterministic prototypes using commonly uh, available parts like uh, Ardis or, or Xilinx FPGAs. Um, we can also build bring up platforms with taped out chips, uh, which I'll highlight a bit later. Um, if you want to tape out a design that you've described in Chipyard, we Chipyard integrates with the Hammer VLSI flow. So you can tape out you know, your custom SOC using some process technology. Uh, Big Nash will talk about this later as well. And of course, there's FireSim, which enables us to do highly accurate um, and very fast FPG accelerated simulations of fairly large SOCs, which you'll see uh, later. OK, but what's actually connect connecting these two components, right? We have these generators. They're you know, emitting our hardware design. And we have these end flows, which all need to do something you know, relatively custom and flow specific. Um, so there's these final two steps that uh, Chipyard uh, essentially integrates before we, it calls out to the, uh, the end flows. And the first step is this thing called IO or harness configuration. And the observation here uh, we made is, um, let's look at the three different uh, essentially um, test harness environments for different use cases, right? So on the far left, you have what your test harness will look like for uh, doing RTL simulation. Um, the blue box is the SOC or the DUT that you're simulating. And the green boxes or you know, the, the boxes at the bottom are essentially C++ models of your various IO. So for example, a C++ model of DRAM or a C++ model of UART. Um, for FireSim, of course, we can't really put a C++ model on the FPGA. Uh, instead, FireSim has its own uh, different models of uh, DRAM and UART and, and clocking and, and all those other IOs. Uh, but they still want to drive the digital system in the same way, right? We don't want to have to like modify our design to make it work in Firestone. I think that was really key here. And, and the same goes for uh, for actually taping out the chip you see on the far right. Um, when you tape out a chip, instead of having models for the IOs, of course, you're actually now building the IOs and driving them, you know, in some bring up environment. Uh, and so and you want to have, you know, the key observation we make here is you want to make sure that your design is the same across all of these three use cases even though the mechanisms for actually interacting with the design are very different. And so this kind of divides the level of configuration in Shipyard into three different levels. Um, the top level is where you actually can configure the digital system itself. Uh, then you configure the IOs of the system. How does that system interact with the outside world? And then finally, the harness configuration is describing what blocks in the outside world interact with the system. Um, and so a complete Shipyard configuration kind of looks more like the thing on the right where you have some set of configuration options for describing the actual SOC or the digital components of the SOC, uh, some configuration options for describing how the SOC talks to the outside world, and other configuration options for describing how the outside world talks to the SOC. Uh, right, and so we call this step, you know, IO and harness binding uh, in the shipyard flow, essentially. All right, the final uh, flow or step that connects these two worlds is going through fertile and circuit transforms. Um, this is basically where we get to actual elaboration of RTL in uh, the Chipyard world. Uh, so the elaboration flow that Chipyard uses is, um, you know, we have this library of chisel generators. As they run, as this program runs, it's going to emit a fertile representation of the SOC you're trying to build. Unless you have this uh, fertile IR, which is kind of like a machine manipulatable netlist, um, the, the fertile compiler uh, can implement a bunch of different passes that will transform the target netlist to do some flow specific things. Uh, for example, Firestone has some fertile passes to insert debug capabilities into the design. Um, VLSI flow has some fertile passes to, you know, for example, adjust the module hierarchy or replace the memories in design with foundry SRAMs. Uh, and then once these, this fertile has been transformed, uh, it's actually, you know, new in Chipyard 1.9 as well. Uh, we actually use circuit for the final stage, uh, Verilog generation to actually synthesize tool-friendly synthesizable Verilog from the fertile that our you know, chisel generators have submitted. And Circuit is a you know, very fast and powerful fertile compiler, and it can generate um, very large designs very quickly, which you'll see later. OK, so you know, summarizing here, this is kind of the, the, the very high-level chip paired flow. We start with you know, the user specifies some custom configuration of an SOC. That configuration drives a bunch of generators, drives a bunch of flows, uh, and eventually, you know, you choose a custom configuration and a target flow, and Chipyard will do the right thing and push your design through that use case for you. Okay, so now I want to provide some motivation for you know why you should actually use Chipyard, or kind of you know what what things can we do with Chipyard. 
Um, so there's this thing called the shipyard learning curve, which uh, I think it's it's it can be it can seem very daunting and steep, but I think the reality is it's just a very long path before you get to the pot of gold at the end. So uh, at the very you know bottom level, when you just start using shipyard, we try to make it easy for you for users to just you know build some custom or semi custom SOC very quickly with existing components, and get simulations up and running very quickly that they can you know open up a waveform viewer and see exactly what's going on in the entire system. Once you get a little bit more familiar, uh, then you get to the evaluation level uh, in Shipyard where you know, you're starting to integrate some custom SOC or so, some custom accelerators, some custom components into Shipyard. Perhaps you're using Firestone FPA accelerated simulations, or maybe you're using Hammer to get you uh, power and area estimates of your design. But essentially, you're using kind of the more advanced features in Shipyard. Really, the pot of gold at the end that you know, we think is like the really cool thing that this kind of all builds up to is once you know how all these components work, then you could do really uh, you know, advanced custom things like developing uh, new models, new IO models for FireSim, or even uh, taping out the complete SOC and getting actual silicon back and bringing that up. Um, so unfortunately, in this tutorial, we'll mostly stay in the bottom two levels here. Uh, but you know, we, we try to, at least in our own research, get to the highest point as much as we can. Um, so one thing is, you know, we, we build Shipyard for research, but we're also a university and we teach undergrads how to do architecture. Um, so it turns out that this kind of framework is really good for education as well. Um, we use Shipyard in almost all of the Berkeley architecture related courses. So things like intro to computer architecture, graduate computer architecture, advanced digital ICs, um, hardware for machine learning. Uh, all of these courses kind of use Shipyard as the baseline framework for students to explore SOC design and evaluate um, you know, custom SOCs. And there's a couple of advantages of using this uh, common shared hardware framework, um, one of which is uh, there's a really reduced ramp up time for students, right? So in the intro course, they kind of learn how to drive these uh, the Shipyard simulators, get basic performance evaluations out. And in the next year, when they take like you know, harder for machine learning, they can just jump right into designing a custom accelerator without having to set up an entirely new simulation or evaluation environment again. And you know, this is really what enables getting you know really advanced course projects done in a single semester is that students can hit the ground running in these courses by using what they learned previously uh, about how to use the system. Uh, I also want to point out that you know we we did build Chipyard to make it easy to build chips. Right, so uh, there's kind of a standard shipyard RTL, or there's a standard shipyard like flow that uh, we use when we try to tape out a chip using shipyard. Um, you know, there's a number of different students, or sometimes the same student doing all of these things, um, doing things like RTL development, uh, evaluation design, fire sim, doing the actual physical design of the chip and hammer, or you know, testing bringing up the chip using FPGA prototypes. Um, and essentially, what the flow is is they all of these tasks work out of the same repository. So there's kind of like a single source of truth for the entire tape out project. Um, this enables parallel workflows across different parts of the flow. Uh, you know, the entire you know, make uh, process for building the GDS that Chipper produces is pretty reproducible, which means you can debug the chip after it's been taped out, right? After I build my chip, someone later can come back, clone the same repo, run, you know, make GDS essentially, and see exactly what set of steps the entire system went through to produce you know, what is probably nearly the exact same GDS that I taped out before. And finally, uh, I found out pretty recently, we can also do things like continuous integration for tape outs. Um, so uh, in this case, some students develop a system where as soon as, you know, uh, whenever someone PR'd into their fork of shipyard, they add CI running to make sure that it didn't break their synthesis replacement route flows. So this really you know, is enabling a lot of cool uh, uh, design speed exploration and, and chip tape outs here. And just as proof of this, uh, we've been teaching a class at Berkeley over the past um, several years on how to tape out chips in a single semester. Um, you know, this class has been kind of ramping up and growing in popularity in spring 2021. It was like 18 students doing one millimeter squared. In spring 2022, it, you know, the class doubled and the area like more than quadrupled. Um, they built two four square millimeter Intel chips, uh, an example of which is actually uh, up here if you want to take a look later. But I think this is kind of proof that we can, you know, Shipyard is friendly enough, the interfaces are accessible enough that we can even teach teams of undergrads to build fairly complex SOCs in a single semester. Um, finally, you know, we try to make Shipyard available to the community. It's designed to be relatively accessible. There's plenty of documentation uh, over, you know, probably nearly 200 pages of documentation covering most of today's tutorial content. 
um, online. There's a mailing list where we're relatively fast at answering questions. And of course, uh, the GitHub where all the code is open source and you know, feel free to open issues, feature requests, PRs, et cetera. Yeah, so that ends uh, this introduction section. Um, you know, Inclusion Shipyard is this open, extensible research and design platform for risk SOCs, which we've been building for uh, several years now. Um, it's a unified framework of parameterized tools of generators designed to be kind of like a one-stop shop for RISC five SFC design exploration uh, chip design. Um, it's open source, community, and research friendly. I think I think there is a break at ten twenty, so I think we have a couple minutes for some questions, um, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back and do the hands-on section uh, where you'll actually be driving Chipyard to build some uh, large custom SFCs. Yeah. So you mostly talked about assembling um, hardware blocks, bus connections, et cetera. But how about the hardware software interfaces like address nets, for example, control right. registers? Right. Also automatically generate? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I think, uh, you know, we, I didn't go over that in so much detail in this talk, but uh, Chipyard or the whole rocket ship uh, like bus generation infrastructure does actually figure out the entire address map of the SOC for you as it's generating the SOC. So, for example, if I, you know, build a couple of devices with some address range, a couple of devices with a different address range, uh, the entire thing checks that, you know, your address ranges don't overlap, um, that your entire system is sane. And then once the entire thing runs, it'll actually emit a couple of files, one of which is a JSON file, which essentially describes the complete address map. Is that the diplomacy step? That's the diplomacy okay. step, yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I believe that there should be some uh, parameter, parameter interface for the, the system failure module because she has to do CPR if you want some automatic parameter discovery. So are you suggesting automatic parameter, parameter discovery of system bear log parameters? I, I heard that several or someone tries to discover the parameter. I don't think so. When you in integrate a system Verilog box with parameters into Chipyard, you you know your Verilog, your system Verilog will you know describe what the parameters are in that file, right? Um, there's no way in Chisel right now to automatically extract those and present the same set of parameters at the Chisel level. Uh, essentially, what we usually do is we say like you know for example, if we have a, a box where like a parameter is like the width of some interface. We have to like in our chisel black box wrapper also say that you know this black box wrapper has that same parameter and just you know kind of match the interfaces manually. Um, I'm not aware of an automated process of doing that, although it might exist in the chisel capabilities. We may have just not heard of it or used it yet. Yeah, so I think there were some grad students here who were looking at PCIe relatively recently. We might bring up a PCIe, like like a target level PCIe harness. Uh, yeah, I think we developed a PCIe like timing model. Maybe Sagar can comment more on that. Um, but yeah, I think a PCIe um, harness or bridge would be a really useful and cool feature to add to this. It's definitely something that we would be happy to open source and you know standardize around if it became available. repository of, of resolutions only open source technologies like SM7. How much effort is it then to plug in my foundry uh, technology and really get it there for my system? Yeah, so uh, the talk on the hammer VLSI flow will go into this in a little more detail, but um, just to you know, uh, preempt that a little bit, uh, it is pretty easy. There's an interface in Hammer which allows you to describe essentially how do you interact with some custom technology. It's called like a Hammer technology library. And you basically write this little library, which is like a, a Python library essentially that describes how, you know, how your tech files work with each other, what kind of, you know, uh, commands you need to send to the tools to make it use your, your, your technology. And, you know, there's a pretty uh, large number of technologies we've been able to bring up using this common interface. So if you have some other technology that uh, we haven't used before, 
then um, we can help you, you know, work, work with you on how to bring that up in Hammer. Uh, but for, I think, common process nodes, it's likely that we already have a library and we might even be able to provide it for you to use. Yeah. But but like the the process plugins are generally <laughs> yeah yeah all right I think we'll take a uh, how long is it ten minute break twenty minute break and we'll be back at ten forty. In the meantime, feel free to grab us, ask us questions. If your uh, if if your terminal seem to be doing something wrong, uh, then let us know as well. We can try to fix that for you. Um, but yeah, I'll see you back in twenty minutes. Hey. <laughs> Uh, this is right. Yeah. All right, so now let's go and uh, configure some custom configuration uh, that we're going to simulate today. So go into uh, MCYDIR generators chipyard. And within that directory, um, go into source main Scala config, another directory. And then you should see a lot of different config files listed here, one of which is called tutorialconfigs.scala. You should open that file up um, in Vim or whatever editor you want. I think Vim and Nano are installed for you. People able to open this file? Anyone unable to open this file? No. Things good? Okay, so let's move on then. What we're going to do is basically what um, is essentially the starting point uh, in Shipyard if you're not just running a built in example, which is building your own SOC config. Um, so we're not going to have you type out the entire config by yourself because typos are very annoying and um, it's easier to just start with something that mostly works already. So uh, near the bottom of this file, line 121 to be exact, you should see a config class defined called tutorial lean Gemini config. This is the one we'll be using uh, for a little bit this morning. Right, And you'll see this config um, and beneath it, there's a bunch of lines doing various things. Uh, so we call those lines uh, doing things like adding cores or adding accelerators. Each of those is like a config fragment uh, where each fragment is setting, overriding, adjusting, uh, or clearing some other keys in the global dictionary for the SOC configuration. Um, so when you build an SOC, you're essentially composing together a bunch of these config fragments that collectively describe the entire SOC that you want. Uh, so for now, what we want to do is um, just mess around a little bit uh, with that config fragment. There's a couple things which you should change um, just to you know, demonstrate how you would configure some accelerator or the number of cores or whatever. Uh, so within the uh, lean Gemini config, there is a flag for use dedicated TL port. Uh, you could set that to false. Uh, you can change the number of boom and rocket cores. I believe the comments in that file recommend that you keep the total number of cores less than eight, uh, mostly because if you set it too high, it will take a long time to simulate the next few steps. Um, and you can also change the number of L2 banks in the system. <laughs> I forget what the default is, it might be four, but you can try one bank, two banks, four banks. I also suggest keeping this number less than or equal to four 
uh, because for now we want to just have a simpler design that just works instead of a more complex one that's going to take a longer time simpler. So edit this file and save it. And then I'll spend a few slides explaining in more detail uh, what these config fragments are doing. Uh, change it from true to false. Or uh, yeah, change it from true to false. All right, so uh, just for some context, I realized I didn't say this on the slide. Um, the set use dedicated tiling port, what this is actually doing is going to change the way that the Gemini accelerator interacts with the rest of the memory system. If it has a dedicated tiling port, it will use its own independent port into the memory interconnect. Whereas if it's false, it'll share a port with the CPU. So obviously this has some performance implications, uh, but you know this is kind of just a very simple example of some design fix exploration you can do here. All right, so what are those config fragments actually doing? Uh, for example, uh, you, uh, let's not look at, I'm not going to tell you to dig into the source code to find out where that config fragment is defined. I've just pasted it on the slides here for you. Um, but with what that config fragment is doing is it's changing this key called banked L2 key, and it's changing that to set its, uh, you know, the requested number of L2 banks to some new value. Right. This is some really. This is a really simple example where you're just changing one number in your global configuration space from you know four to two or four to one or whatever. But uh, for the Gemini configuration fragment, uh, it can. This is just to demonstrate that the config fragments can get more complicated. In this case, the key that is changing is this build rock key, uh, which returns a function that generates rock accelerators. Right. And so when you add this fragment to your SOC configuration. What you're basically doing is you're adding a new function to the build rock key, and that function, when it's called, is going to generate uh, this custom Gemini accelerator. And you can imagine somewhere else in the source code for the you know core generators, you know the core generators for Boom and Rocket, it's going to look up the value in this key uh, for this function and call that function to you know generate an instance of the accelerator. So you can do a lot of like interesting you know uh, functional programming. Uh, tricks here to build a very complicated configuration system that builds many different devices uh, on your on your SOC. And essentially, this is a very small example of how the rest of the configuration fragment system works. Okay, has everyone edited that file and saved it now? Good, good. Okay, so let's close that file and go back out into the directory where we're actually going to run simulations and generate RTL for this design. So this is the top level directory mcydir sims exilium. And the command we want to type is make space capital config equals and then the name of the config, which is tutorial lean Gemini config. So uh, when you're doing this, be careful to not make typos. Gemini has two Ms, for example. Um, Essentially, this is saying we're going to run the shipyard generator and try to generate an Exilium simulator uh, using um, this class as the base design. And this will take, I think, less than five minutes. Yeah. Can you please summarize the advantages or compare this CPU to like this chair or everything? Uh, I think there's some. <laughs> We're not supposed to really compare the tools, but obviously the commercial tools have many advantages over uh, Verilator. Exilium support actually is uh, very recent. It's a new feature in 1.9 actually. So I actually don't have a comparison between Exilium and VCS. Uh, I do know that Exilium and VCS are both much more robust than Verilator. Um, they compile simulators very quickly. They compile very large simulators. Uh, so for context, in prior tutorials, we've generally had attendees build single core designs um, that were very fast because we didn't have Exilium access. And using Verilator, you couldn't just you just couldn't build and simulate a very large config quickly. Um, but here in this tutorial, you can see you're already building like you know maybe a four core and, or an eight core system, um, and we're going to be able to simulate that relatively quickly. 
Um, yeah, that, that would not be possible with Verilator, unfortunately. Yeah. All right, uh, as this command is running, you should see a bunch of stuff being dumped to your terminal. Um, hopefully not a bunch of red error messages. Uh, is anyone seeing a bunch of red error messages? Okay, you might see one error message that says error Java tool options not found. That is not an error. That is a problem with the JVM that we don't know how to fix. So, <laughs> um, you guys have questions or anything? Yeah. yeah so, uh, just describe what's going on. Um, the chisel generators, you can add like print statements to the generators, and the print statements you know, that you're seeing are probably what those generators are emitting. I think one thing that gets printed that's fairly notable is the device tree string for the entire SOC. Um, and that, you know, if you know what a device tree string is, it's like kind of a structured representation of the devices, cores, peripherals on your system. Uh, and so it's got to describe the SOC to Linux and so Linux knows how to manipulate it. Um, eventually you should get to a point where uh, you'll see some other commands being run. If you, you know, really look, uh, look at the commands, you'll see that it's calling like uh, fur tool, which is a circuit compiler. Um, it might be calling uh, the Scala photo compiler as well, depending on where you are, the flow. Um, and then eventually you'll get to calling Xcelate. And that the first one of time, this new stage uh, after the turbo, the compiler? Um, the circuit compiler? Or the, the yes. So before 1.9, the entire flow from Fertile to Verilog was done in something called the Scala Fertile Compiler, which is, you know, a Fertile Compiler written in Scala. Um, now there's been a lot of development uh, outside, um, you know, by across like many different companies and open source contributors as well towards this tool called Circuit, which is like designed to be this open library of uh, circuits, um, tools and compilers. It's like it has its own uh, intermediate representation. And that, because it's like kind of built out of the like LLVM MLR infrastructure, it's like very well developed, very fast. And we're kind of trying to switch as much of the flow as we can from the old Scala based approach to the new uh, circuit based approach. And I'll show in, in a couple of slides um, how this has enabled us to do some cool things, but it's one very obvious advantage is that it's much, much faster than the older uh, pure Scala compiler. I think the number we quoted was um, for large designs, the, the circuit fertile compiler can be up to 20x faster than the Scala fertile compiler. Yeah, so previously we had designs that would take like, you know, 30 minutes or even like we could build things that would take like six hours to generate Verilog for. Now we could do that in like, I don't think I've ever seen it take more than like five or 10 minutes to generate the Verilog or something. Okay, um, when this command finishes, it should drop you back into your terminal. Has this command finished for anyone? All right, good, great. All right, so let's actually see, um, for those of you who uh, have finished this, uh, we can see what it is generated. So ls, the generated source directory. This is a directory which, you know, the output of some make command or some uh, uh, simulation flow tries to dump all the Verilog sources or other sources within this directory. Uh, so if you ls that directory, you'll see that there should be uh, two existing directories, one of which is the one you just made, uh, the tutorial lean Gemini config. So you should try to CD into the one you just made. I didn't include the full name in the slides because I think the full name is like chipyard.testharness.tutorial lean Gemini config, but um, that's the directory you want to uh, CD into. And then do ls, and just take a look at the files that are generated. Yes, tab completion mostly works here. Definitely tab complete your way through the rest of this tutorial. <laughs> All right, so let's look at what's actually generated in this directory. Um, there's a couple things I want to point out. Uh, the first is there's a file that ends in .dts. This is a device tree string. Uh, you know, because we care about hardware software integration and because software needs to know what the hardware actually has, uh, this is kind of the standard way to provide that information to the Linux kernel. Right, the Linux kernel essentially, or this device tree string gets embedded into um, 
the boot ROM of the chipper SOCs. And then during the Linux boot process, that uh, a pointer to this device tree string is essentially passed to Linux. So Linux can read it and figure out like what cores are on the system, what the memory map is, you know, what devices there are. And so it knows how to you know, bring itself up. Um, you'll also see a file called, that ends in .fir. If you uh, open that file using, maybe, probably not them, but uh, less if you know how to use that. Um, it is a very large file because this is plain text of the fertile intermediate representation for the design. So essentially uh, the entire circuit for this SOC that you made. And this, there's this other directory called uh, gen collateral, and I'll have you guys look inside here next. This is a directory containing all of the output Verilog files, test harness files, C++ models uh, that are gonna be used when simulating our design. Um, so uh, if you're inside the generated source, the correct generated source directory, you can CD into this gen collateral directory and start seeing uh, what's in here, right? Um, so, one thing you can do first is do ls star.cc to see all the C++ source files that are in here. These are files that uh, for models that uh, we need in our SOC simulation. So you'll see a file for um, like sim uart, for example, is the uart model that, you know, so we can print the console output. Uh, you'll see a file for like sim DRAM. So we have like our backing memory model and a couple other files as well. It's just, you know, C++ models. Uh, of course, because we're trying to build hardware, probably the more interesting and uh, part of this is if you ls all the files that end in .sv, the system Verilog files, um, you'll see a bunch of different files come out. These are all the modules that are part of the design you just built. Um, if you look in here, you'll probably see some files for like uh, Boom Tile or Rocket Tile uh, or Gemini, for example. Um, but uh, I'll have you, there's there's two specific files that are kind of more interesting here. Um, one of which is chiptop.sv and the other one, which is testharness.sv. Uh, so I'll explain what those are in a moment. But does anyone run into any issues up to this point? Everything's good. Okay, so these two files, chiptop.systemverilog and testharness.systemverilog, um, are kind of important for the rest of the flow or kind of notable here. Uh, so chiptop is actually the design which we're trying to build, essentially the DUT. It contains, uh, if you open the file, you'll see it contains a single module instance called chiptop. Um, this is essentially a single die in its top level IO. And so if you're passing this design to a VLSI flow, this would essentially be the thing that you run synthesis and place it out on. Um, and in the FireSim as world as well, this is what we model the dust to be. So this is the kind of thing which FireSim is going to preserve uh, the timing accuracy for. It's gonna to try to model faithfully to how you would actually uh, see it behave as a real chip. And the other file is testharness.sv, which contains you know, the test harness. Uh, this thing instantiates a chip top and a bunch of other IO devices. So it'll instantiate you know, the models or wrappers around the models for things like DRAM and UART. Okay, uh, I just wanted to show you uh, what this generated. You know, if you didn't want to use the rest of the chip guard simulation flow, you could just take all the system Verilog and pass it through your own simulation flow or VLSI flow or do whatever you want. Um, with it, but this is essentially um, you know the very first stage of what Shipyard generates that's kind of usable. Um, so now let's compile some software that'll run on this uh, SOC that we just built. So for compiling software, there's kind of three approaches broadly that we can do uh, using the tool chain we've set up. Um, there's bare metal software, which of course has no virtual memory, no OS, and no system calls. However, it's very very fast, right? You just jump straight into the main of your program. Um, there's this other world, you know, of course, on the other end of the spectrum, there's Linux where you compile an app for Linux and you can't run it unless you boot Linux on the SOC. Um, and to do that, you have to run it as an FPGA prototype or run the binary on FireSim. And you'll do this later in the tutorial. Um, there's this other thing called proxy kernel, which is kind of a midway point between bare metal and Linux, where it's like a fake OS that proxies syscalls to the x86 host. Um, we're still not going to use that today because it's still much slower than bare metal and we just need fast as possible simulations for today since we're building relatively large designs. 
So let's go to this directory called mcyjr slash tests and just run make. Um, it's possible that when you run make, it will say nothing needs to be done. And that is because we pre-compiled everything for you. So uh, in that case, that's actually good. Uh, and after that, let's just test these binaries work. Um, we can do our classic hello world, do spike hello dot risk five. Um, that should print hello world. And then the next two, uh, the ones that start with mt hello dot risk five, you should run those as well. <coughs> but, but keep in mind that for the multi threaded test, spike will not exit the binary for you automatically. So it'll just run the commands and get stuck in a busy loop, and you have to control C twice to exit out of spike. Um, this is a limitation in the software because uh, these bare metal compilation flows um, don't provide a easy exit to exit, a easy method to exit out of the program when you're running a multi-threaded program. Yeah, and uh, for these MT hello tests, you should see it should print like all the core IDs and the identity of the core, which you should see it. The program has correctly detected that it is running within a spike modeled core. That's good. Okay. Well, running it on spike is okay, but I just want to test that these programs work for now. Um, now let's run some programs that work, uh, that, that use the Gemini accelerator, which you added to your SRC. Uh, so I'll skip this because we're running short on time. Um, do the same thing here. Uh, there's a binary called mtgemini.risk5. And if you run that uh, without passing the dash dash extension equals Gemini flag to spike, you should see uh, like failed error equals two message. That means that, you know, in the first case here, you're running spike without support for the Gemini extension. So it's going to get legal instruction errors and just immediately kill itself. Um, but if you run it with the dash dash extension equals Gemini flag, you should see that um, it prints uh, the core number and then the number of cycles that it believed the command took. Uh, of course, in Spike, this is not like performance accurate. So the number of cycles there is going to be some meaningless number. It's really the number of instructions, but you know, it's doing the right thing. Is everyone able to get these programs to work? Everyone able to confirm that spike dash dash extension equals Gemini MT Gemini dot risk five print something sane. Great. Okay, so for actually running things on the RTL simulators, it's pretty similar to running it in spike. Uh, we encapsulate the commands within a make target. And there's a couple of make targets which are useful. Um, the one we're going to use in this tutorial is called run binary hex. Um, which is run a binary with the fast load man capability. So it loads the binary into target memory very quickly. There's also make targets that will run the binary and generate a waveform of the simulation at the same time. So it's useful for debugging, of course. Um, and then the flags, which are useful, uh, you know, the config flag specifies what config to build and run the binary on. And the binary flag specifies what binary to run. So, uh, Let's just go back into the sims exilium directory, go to mcyder sims exilium and do make config equals tutorial lean Gemini config, binary equals mcyder tests, and then you can do hello.risk5, mt hello.risk5, or mt Gemini.risk5. And then the target for the make command is run binary, run dash binary dash hex. So if you run this, if you run one of these commands, you should see some console output. It should say like X run starting simulation or something. It will appear to pause for a few seconds as it's trying to acquire a license. And then once it's acquired a license, it should print some message about uh, cadence. And then it will print UART starting at which point it is running your binary. Yeah. 
it loads it into the off chip memory of the SOC. Can you then also load additional data? Right. So uh, the way this works is the L file contains like a bunch of sections, right? And the run binary hex thing, uh, somewhere in the outer DRAM model, it basically parses the L file for all the data sections and loads them at the addresses the L file specifies. So you have data at like a different address, you just encode it somewhere else in your L that's like a different section with a different starting address and the thing will figure it out for you. Um, if you want to load memory into a region that is not off chip or is not the standard like backing memory model, then you just use the run binary command instead of run binary hex. So we can load on chip memory as well instead of just off chip memory. The downside is in order to load on chip memory, we have to simulate the process of like, you know, banging the, the bytes into the thing. So it's much slower, uh, which is why for, for this part, we're having you just, you just, just do the run binary hex. It's a faster. Yeah. Okay, so these commands will take a little bit of time depending on which one runs. Uh, Exilium is pretty fast, uh, but you know, the reality is RTL simulations are pretty slow still. Um, for the Hello Darvis 5 test, that should complete in like less than five minutes. But for the other two, it should be less than 10 minutes each. Um, yeah, for MT Gemini Darvis 5, you should see that each, uh, uh, you know, each core is Gemini is taking like a different number of cycles to complete the task. Fast load mem, right? Um, that's the that's essentially what the run binary hex thing does. When you add the dash hex flag to run binary, or you know, when you use the hex variants, um, it generates a uh, hex file of the memory to be loaded, and it passes that into the um, the backing memory model through the fast load mem flag. So. Yeah, so it'll it'll like instantaneously like you know just do a giant mem copy into the model and then you know take your simulator out of reset and, and run it. Uh, in Exilium, I believe that is supported like as part of what Exilium supports, but we haven't exposed that in like a flow that's easy to get. So you'll you'll if you dig around after this, you'll you can see that um, there is a file inside the general inside the Sims Exilium directory that starts with Sim X. That is essentially the script that's running Exilium and passing all of our flags into it. Um, I believe if you, instead of using these make commands to um, to drive the simulation, you could hack that script to do whatever you need to do, like save a checkpoint or you know stop and resume somewhere. Yes, yeah. So if you put like eight boom cores on, it will take a little bit longer, unfortunately. <laughs> it'll say, I think it'll probably say um, core, yeah, hello from, okay, okay. So it depends which binary you ran. If you ran the hello hello.risk5 one, the single threaded one, that one only uses core zero. So it depends what core zero was in that system. If you ran uh, <laughs> um, empty hello, it'll have all the cores print out their core ID and the type of the core. I think for Boom, it'll actually print out unknown as the core type, which is a bug in the software currently. Um, but otherwise, uh, yeah. Does this just use the standard cadence installation or is there much customization involved that we want to run these in our own systems which have a cadence configuration? The only customization for this tutorial was that we're forwarding the license server okay. to your AWS instances. Okay. Otherwise it's standard. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me take a look.
this the actual output? Oh yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So that's how many cycles each Gemini accelerator is taking to do the thing. Here for the empty hello, I get after the four core. Yeah, so that means core four is your boom core. And then you just control C. Oh yeah, I should mention that um, once the binary has printed everything you expect it to print, uh, you need to control C out of it as well. So just do control C um, because the binaries don't have a self-terminating functionality uh, for the multi-threaded use cases. Yeah, so uh, when you build your configuration, you are basically adding or like concatenating cores into a list. I believe the default adds a rocket and then it adds the booms. But if you like flip those later, yeah. After the tutorial, if you want to like play around with that and see what happens, go for it. I think the default right now is to put the rockets first. It's working. Oh, yeah. Great. Does MT Gemini simulation have to be aborted manually? Yes. All the simulations that have MT have to be aborted manually. This is. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I should have mentioned that at the beginning. Um, yeah. uh, I uh, spent a little bit of time trying to make it so that you didn't have to abort, but it was for bad reasons, it was unreasonably difficult to do this. <laughs> well, so so here's the problem. Um, the software doesn't know how many cores are on the system. So how do you know which core, like when the core is finished, how does it know it's the last core to finish? All the cores have no idea about each other. So yeah, this is the problem of doing like a bare metal multi-threaded workload. It's not really supported well. So it's kind of, you know, resorting to hacks to make this work. All right, um, we're running out of time for this section. So uh, I'll move on. If you didn't run all three binaries, that's okay. We'll keep the instances alive for you. Um, I think for the rest of the day, or for a couple hours after the, or yeah, probably for the rest of the day. So you can always go back and, and catch up on something. Um, I want to point out that we can now support building uh, very large SOCs in Shipyard 1.9, a combination of different features that uh, are new in 1.9 kind of support this. So I mentioned Circuit. Um, it's a much faster fertile compiler. There's also a feature called clone tiles, which is uh, it allows us to instantiate <laughs> a tile once and then create many copies of the of the tile, so we don't have to like repeatedly create many instances of the same design. And we also have a, a scalable network on chip interconnect generator now, so we can build like you know a more realistic many core system instead of just tying them all to a shared like a crossbar or something. Um, so just as an example of the the giant config. Um, if you go back to MCYDIR generators chipyard source main Scala config, there's a file there called uh, tutorialconfigs.scala, uh, the same file you opened earlier. And in the bottom of the file, um, you'll find a config called tutorial many core NOC config. Uh, now you don't need to edit this config. Um, this one is already set up for you, but this is this config describes essentially the topology and SOC architecture on the right. Uh, where we have a six by four mesh network on chip uh, with 28 coherent risk five cores. Um, the boom cores on the left and right edge are uh, 10 wide sonic boom cores. We have eight banks of L2, each of which shares like a network on chip node with two rocket cores. And of course, we also have our four rocket and Gemini cores uh, along the bottom as well. Um, so this is, uh, of course, like a fairly, like a much more aggressive design than the one you just built, and it will take much longer to build the RTL for. Um, but uh, if you are willing to have this simulation, uh, have this run, you know, take a couple of minutes, it'll stretch, you know, it can run in the background for the next section, uh, which is not interactive as well. Uh, so that's okay. Um, you can go back into the Sims Exilium directory and run like the same set of commands, except change you know, tutorial lean Gemini config to tutorial many core NOC config. And you can run the same command, uh, you know, the run binary hex targets to run the binary on it. Um, in this case, the binaries that'll work are hello.risk5 and mt-hello.risk5. Uh, mt Gemini doesn't work because uh, in this configuration, only some of the cores have Gemini because we're trying to make it you know, a little bit more realistic of the system. Um, this design is uh, very large. Um, it will take like 
10 minutes or so to, to generate all of the Verilog for it. Um, and then running the simulation of Hello or Hello World or Visify will take you know 10 plus minutes about that. Actually running the multi-threaded Hello World test uh, will actually take many hours to finish because um, the simulation will be incredibly slow as it's trying to simulate all uh, 28 cores and four Gemini accelerators. Um, but if you wait around for like 10 or 15 minutes, I think the first core will print Hello World and that will show you that at least it's alive. Um, but I mean, yeah, unfortunately the reality of RTL simulation is we can't actually do these large designs <laughs> even, even though we have Exilium now. Uh, but this is just to show you that, you know, we can at least generate the RTL for it and tape out such large designs if we decide. Sorry, can you say that again? Behind this design. Oh, the clone tiles. Yeah, so um, the way clone tiles works is you, you create one normal tile, whether it's like a rocket tile or a boom tile, and then you add a bunch of cloned copies of that tile on top of each other. So if you look inside tutorial many core not config, you'll see that there's a line where it's like with one rocket tile, and then it adds like three copies of it uh, so collectively, you'll have four copies of the same tile. It's a little bit finicky to use right now, but uh, the API does work, and it allows you to build these large designs very quickly. It's um, it's using a old Chisel API that hasn't been exposed in Rocketship called Clone Modules Record. Basically, instead of instantiating a new module, go find another module. Uh, and just create another instance of it and point to its IO. And so that API was exposed in Rocketship as like this clone tiles feature. And that API is now also exposed in Shipyard through the clone tile configurations. Yeah. yeah. Does this topology get like propagated over the line of the primary before planning and stuff? Or does that, you have to do that separately? That is a great question. And that is something which we will probably be working on. Uh, All right. <laughs> <laughs> that is something which we want is uh, more topology guided physical design and floor planning. Yeah, but this topology is uh, just chosen because it's kind of big. It's not necessarily, uh, I don't think it really is like that interesting, but. <laughs> okay, so uh, the last couple of slides here. Um, this is just to show you how it configures an octopology. Um, we request that the system bus should be a network on chip. And then we simply just map all the agents in our system, whether they're cores, cache banks, uh, other buses, whatever, onto nodes in this octopology. So you'll see that uh, you know, we're mapping cores onto node one, two, three, four, seven, seven, eight, eight. Uh, you can map multiple cores into the same node, um, whatever you want. Um, and then at the bottom, we're specifying the actual topology and configuration of the network. So in this case, it's a six by four uh, 2D mesh. Yeah, so I think that's the last slide. Um, feel free to play around with these configurations later. Try different core configurations. You can uh, you know, try to see how far the big configuration gets in your simulation. Um, Inclusion, um, oh, I guess it's one other thing to try. Uh, we added this new feature new in 1.9 as well, which will try to show you all the different configuration options that are available across all the different shipyard packages. So if you run in the Sims Exilium directory, run make uh, with the find config fragments target, this command will take, I think like a minute or two to run. It's going to search all your Scala source files and find all the config fragments that you can use to add to your design and like, you know, change some setting or something. So um, this is kind of like a way to just see like the wide scope of different uh, configuration options that Shapiro SOC support. Um, yeah, and that's it for this hands-on section of the tutorial. Uh, I'll hand it off to Vignesh, who'll go into uh, how do we actually take these designs and get back um, actual silicon? <laughs> <laughs>